Hi everyone, good evening and thank you for joining me for tonight's web, uh, webinar excuse me, on photographing the night. Um, I'm Anthony Zacharias, um, a, a commercial photographer and speaker, lecturer, book author. Um, as I say, I'm very proud to have you guys join me this evening and also be, um, of course, proud to be a, a, a BenQ ambassador who are um, bringing us this web, webinar this evening um, together with Park Cameras. Um, as I say, I'm an author of a number of photography books. Um, my first here is Mastering Long Exposure, and that's um, what we'll sort of touch on part of a couple of chapters within this book this evening um, regarding um, photographing the night. Um, Mastering Long Exposure is, uh, was also co-published by National Geographic in Italy, as you can see here, the, the covers. Um, I've written a couple of other books. I just briefly mentioned everything you always wanted to know about taking better photographs. Um, which we'll dip in and out of a little bit, more talking about compositional tips and tricks and techniques and things like that. And then two from the 52 assignments range um, with uh, by Ammonite Press, which are sort of published in certain countries in Europe as well as the UK and the US. So um, I've done the travel photography um, and the photographic exposure from this, this series, quite fun little gift books that sort of get you through a, a, an impasse of when you um, really want a little bit of inspiration to head out and about. But um, my contact information, if anyone has any uh, questions that you forget about uh, to do this evening, we'll do a Q&A at the end of this um, webinar. Please do feel free to reach out to me um, or if something arises later on down the line. Um, very quickly, um, Park Cameras are very kindly offering a discount code um, which will be um, available in the chat. Um, the chat box at the end of this webinar. So if you hang on to the end, um, you'll be able to, to get that exclusive discount code. But I'm going to jump straight in because I'm covering quite a lot this evening. And I thought I'd start with uh, photographing the blue hour. So the blue hour itself, although it's not technically an hour, um, it's depending on where you, where you are, but it's roughly an hour, just over an hour usually. Uh, but it's a wonderful time to head out and photograph the evening. As you can see here, the classic shot of central London, Big Ben or the Elizabeth Clock Town, Westminster in central London. So it's a, a fantastic time when you still have sufficient ambient light in the sky to illuminate the whole scene you can still see the lovely cloud information nice you know detail on, on the buildings themselves but the cities have come to light uh, uh, you know the energy and the dynamics of just the artificial lights have come together and you'll help you find that that's a wonderful time to photograph and you've got that lovely combination of the the blue skies and the as i say the, the warm tones from from all the artificial lighting um, it can be a little bit difficult to balance the uh, the lights with the ambient sky um, obviously um, you've got to take care about exposure and we'll talk about exposure in a, a little bit later on but some you know fantastic time to photograph and usually in the sort of spring and summer seasons You'll find in later on during the blue hour, the winds drop a little bit, and you get these lovely reflections like here in Amsterdam. But it's a lovely combination between artificial lights and and uh, the natural lights in the in the uh, evening sky. Um, you have to take care, though, as I say, the light changes very very quickly. It's a blue hour, so it can um, be a little bit tricky to. By the time you find your settings, you'll find that they won't be the same on your, on your camera for very long. So you, you do have to sort of adapt quite quickly. But still, uh, you know, a wonderful time to head out and about and, and really capture strong dynamic images. Um, just bearing in mind that uh, obviously highlights are overexposed, and this is something I'll touch on for throughout the presentation. You know, when we're taking photographs in the evening, when we've got minimal minimal um, ambient light and um, uh, certainly a changing environment and a changing light and so uh, we do have to watch out uh, especially when we start thinking about using periods of, of seconds you know when we're talking about changing our settings from 5 10 15 20 seconds um at a time rather than milliseconds as we would be doing during the day we can get a little bit carried away quite easily overall by you know the energy and, and, and the excitement of being out in the, in the urban environment perhaps or just even in the countryside but at night time so we have to play pay close attention to uh, not overexposing the highlights and that sort of thing but sometimes you'll find in the blue hour itself we don't really have much cloud information um, like here this is a castle in north wales conning castle but it's a wonderful time still to um, take the, the, the photographs you know even without the cloud information i know a lot of landscape photographers are probably um rolling their eyes at this comment but still i think 
no cloud doesn't really detract from the image in this particular um, scene, for example, that the castle is really sort of popping off the screen. It's drawing your attention straight into um, the strong sodium lamps or the yellow tones illuminating that castle and really making it feel like it's, it's jumping off the page. There's no distractions behind with any cloud information. But equally so, sometimes we do, you know, it's, it's fantastic to have the little soft pink hues and the, the post sunset uh, colours that are still reflected in the clouds here in downtown Miami in Key Biscayne. So we've got all that combination, the artificial illuminations um, of the urban environment reflecting in the waters, but also the soft pink and the softness of the sky, you know, together um, helps build up layer upon layer. And that's something that, um, as I talk through some various aspects of tonight's presentation, that I really want to sort of focus on that uh, it's a way to improve your photography is to really think about building up as I say these different layers on your in your images you know what aspects are you going to 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 uh, help advance your scene you know you choose a nice scene you've got the composition right you think you choose the time of day whether it's the blue hour or on the evening we want the ambient light we want sufficient artificial lights thinking about which are aperture spikes depth of field getting exposure you know these are all elements to, to consider and how to improve your, your images overall but again you know uh, the blue hour here back in paris at the louvre gallery it's a wonderful time to photograph you'll find that you get a, a not only this little bit of stillness later in the evening but you know, tourists will head home the louvre in, in the middle of the day as many of you i'm sure know it, it's just um, inundated by tourists milling around and um, queuing up but as soon as the, it moves into later in the evening um you, you sometimes find that you get to the the luxury of having these places almost to yourself too um blue hour again back into miami you know if you take panoramic images and you really enjoy taking these really wide um, vistas um, stitching together a number of images this is actually five images um, stitched together in photoshop all taken in the vertical portrait um, position um, you know just because it's the dark night sky or the blue hour don't think that photoshop can't handle stitching images together you can as long as you um, take the images relatively quickly don't don't wait a long period of time between each image but also help Photoshop. So do photograph these images with a good 40, maybe 50% overlap, um, so that there's a lot of data there for Photoshop to be able to stitch the images together. But you can get these really strong, wide vistas, as I say, that will help, um, obviously, increasing the, uh, the megapixel count for those who, you know, when you're stitching your images together, the resolution will become much more uh, larger, so enabling you to print these in a much, much larger form. But, um, you know, it's a wonderful time to, to think about capturing a wide view, just being able to stitch those all together. And then after the blue hour, just because the, the sun, uh, the, the lights has started to fade, um, it doesn't mean that you should just pack up and head home. You know, you still get uh, those dark, inky inky black skies in this image here of paris we still have the wonderful reflections the darker night sky really helps um you know draw your attention in a similar way to a sense that i showed you the, the castle image but also quite often the night sky can, can be a little bit flat and, and lack detail and lack any sort of contrast or texture but that's not always the case as you can see here very very strong clouds very um dynamic sky um but then equally so yeah, back in St Paul's uh, Cathedral in London, it doesn't necessarily detract from the image too much, you know, um, just by having no cloud information visible, or we just have one of those cloudy skies that unfortunately there just isn't anything. I think it really helps it accentuate the colours, helps the colours pop as well, really draw your eye compositionally into the shape and form of your subject or your composition where you've decided to place various elements within your 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 frame you know the four edges of your your frame that you, you're choosing to uh, capture your scene but again it's a wonderful time to be out and about I, I love architecture i'm primarily an architectural photographer um from a commercial point of view but i love the ability you know the, to, to walk around capture these sort of, uh, interesting moments of of the urban night um some inclement weather downpours you know it, it's a, it's a most of the time, you know, when it's raining, we all want to pack up and, and run home and, and um, jump it back into the car or whatever it may be. But if you can find yourself with a really nice vantage point, a canopy over a shop or a doorway or, arch, you know, a tunnelway, I was, you know, this downpour uh, was uh, torrential as it often is in London, but um, 
the camera was protected, I was under an awning at a shop front, um, and just you get these wonderful reflections um, back up of the uh, urban environment, and, and it really helps you capture a sense of mood and an essence of feeling, which is obviously what we want to do. As photographers, we want to you know, create a, a sense of um, relatableness to our uh, relatability to our images we want our audience to connect to, to see a story or um, have some mystery or intrigue or questions to answer and, and think about and that will help retain your audience's gaze in your images which is what you want as a photographer you want your audience to appreciate the beauty appreciate what they're seeing but also be you know, drawn into it to, to really sort of want to see more and, and think about what's going on in front of them um, you can use filters at night too. There are um, mist diffuser filters like this one, the Homo mist diffuser filter that I use, but there's lots of black filters. And what they do is create this wonderful sort of blur around highlights, as you can see over the car headlights and around the neon signs and things like that. So they give a very cinematic feel, a very soft feel. So, you know, you can think about um, possibly utilizing filters at night, certain filters. We'll talk about neutral density filters um, a little bit later on not necessarily quite so um, uh, relevant at night, neutral density filters, but nevertheless. But white balance, I was just asked very quickly, a white balance um, issues. Um, I keep my white balance actually on a valorative mode, or which is uh, the matrix mode. Uh, on Nikon, it's valuative on Canon, which is what I use. Um, but what that, that is doing is it's the, it's the mode where your, your camera is dividing your image up into equal tiny little segments. And then it's, it's taking some white balance information from all of those little se segments and then calculating what it deems to be the correct exposure. The exposure meters on our cameras are fantastic. You know, cameras are the tool of, that we want to utilize. Some of the auto modes, you know, automatic white balance, we'll talk about that in a moment, you know, um, really utilize some of the tools and, and, the, and the way that our cameras can really help us. Yes, we should know the exposure triangle, we should know how to use manual and all, all those kind of things and know when to, how to do it and when to, to use it. But also there's nothing wrong with, you know, putting the camera into auto ISO mode if that's what, you know, can assist you take one of the elements out of the equation and while you, you know, get to better grips or, you know, aperture priority mode so that the camera will work out the you know the necessary shutter speed and that's one less thing for you to think about perhaps you know until you get very very familiar with um you know what the settings really should be and um, quite often i'm asked about what settings what are my specific settings for each particular image um we're going to talk about aperture in a moment but what i wanted to say was obviously the light changes very very quickly at night and you know i think it's interesting to know the ballpark figures of what is useful so for, say for example um this image here looking down into the river you know tower tower bridge in central london um unless we're sitting or standing next to one another with our cameras on a tripod um then all of the exif information, you know, the shutter speed, the apertures, all these things are, are useful to you because you're, you're there at the same scene. But I think it can be a bit misleading to say, well, you know, I took this image at 42 seconds and et cetera, et cetera. And then you think that that's the, the, the go-to for, for this particular scene. I don't think that that's particularly useful. I think it's interesting to know a ballpark shutter speed figure. So this image, for, for example, was actually about 35 seconds or something like that. So knowing that you're going to be looking rather than dialing in a minute and a half or whatever it may be, um, for example, or five seconds, knowing a good starting point is, is helpful. Knowing the specific information isn't necessarily as useful um, as you may think. In my book, Mastering Long Exposure, I put in all the information, the focal length to all of the um, settings, um, just so it's there. But I think talking you through some of these images, it's more important to know about um, aperture, is, for example, in this particular image, is much more important. Depth of field here. So um, I'll be using a very, very narrow aperture, f16, something like that, um, because the foreground, all the architecture in the foreground, the bridge itself, and the architecture in the distance is what I want in sharp focus, and that's far more important um, or, or useful, I should say, really, to, to, to you as an audience rather than the shutter speed. Um, if you know what aperture you're going to be dialing in you'll want to use i always use the lowest um, iso that i can um, if camera's going to be on a tripod i want the best quality image so for me it's a canon it's a native based iso of 100 is usually my go-to as much as i can obviously um, it will fluctuate on, on a number of factors but if i'm choosing my aperture due to depth of field constraints and my 
ISO to get the best quality, then perhaps let the camera work out the shutter speed for you, or at least as a starting point, if you're not exactly sure, but with practice and time, you'll find that that becomes more evident and obvious. Um, but these two images that I've just included are really just to show you that if the sky is not particularly interesting, you've got a lot of high, you know, high cloud or lacking any detail or any information, then just cut them out. You know, you don't really need any cloud information uh, to, to cloud or, or sky, I should say, to like this image or, or this one over the rooftops in Paris. Um, it's not really going to detract from your image by not having the sky. In fact, I think it works to make a stronger composition if rather than have a big blob of, of sky that's got no information in it at all. Perhaps a, a big streak of black, a, a very dark sky where you've missed the blue owl, perhaps, you know, wouldn't necessarily add anything into this particular image. So, better to cut it out. And equally, you know, don't forget getting down on streets, street level. Um, it's very, very interesting to capture compelling shots at night, you know, intimate low level shots. Um, it can be a little bit tricky to, you know, if you're a, a very popular landmark, such as here in Westminster again, to wait for tourists to, to move through your scenes um, in the, during the blue hour perhaps, or when, when certain times of, of the day, but certainly later in the evening, you get to much more of the scene to yourself, as I say. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, dark skies, yes, there's not very much information here visible in the night sky, but equally so, um, it really helps the colours in the scene pop, pop the, you know, there's no distracting elements. Um, main distracting element, perhaps, is this aperture spike here, right in the middle, and that's our next um, topic that I wanted to, to talk about, the starburst effect or the aperture spikes as they're known. And for those of you who don't know how this is um, achieved, um, it's, it's very simple actually. It's achieved by using a very small aperture, again f16 or f18. I don't personally go beyond f18 um, as a rule of thumb for me. As a, as a photographer, I recommend you to do similar. Um, many lenses go f22, f29 or beyond, but you have to be careful that um, diffraction, the, the way that the light bends within the lens um, at very, very small apertures will affect the sharpness, the resulting sharpness of your images. Um, so you'll find that perhaps after f18, um, you may end up with slightly softer images, and, and that's something I don't want to sacrifice. I usually find the depth of field requirements are adequately met when using it for 16 or F18. But this particular image, it's an underpass under, in, in Miami, uh, in Key Biscayne, it's called the Rickenbacker Causeway. And the sort of little small backstory to this really is it's, uh, uh, I used to live in Miami and uh, I'd driven past this uh, scene, beautiful scene for so many times and one evening decided to uh, jump out of the car and, and grab the shot. Not the safest environment, probably one of those times where you will time to go a little bit faster than it should, trying to keep one eye in, uh, in front of you and one eye over your shoulder for safety. But um, nevertheless, I knew in this particular case that I saw the street lights um, above the, um, the flyover and knew by shooting with F16 or F18, I'd be creating this aperture spike. And this is one of those times where you really need to sort of slow down a little bit, think about what you're um, going to achieve. And so I knew by taking a few paces to position myself where I could see the street lights, um, that I knew that the camera, obviously the eye won't see this aperture spike, but I knew that the camera would make the spike around the uh, or starburst effect around the bright street light so centralizing it and posit thinking about my composition very carefully in my position um, there is no technical foreground interest as such but in this particular image at the top of the screen the underpass i wanted all that in sharp focus i wanted that's my foreground as such i put a vignette i darkened it down slightly um just to sort of draw your eye a little bit more into the scene but all of that is in very, very sharp focus through into the mid-ground, so where that aperture spike is and those three blue pillars in the middle of the image, that's in sharp focus. And obviously the architecture and the skyscrapers in the background are all in sharp focus, therefore needing a deep depth of field. Knew I was going to be shooting at F16, thinking what how this was all going to um, correlate together to create the starburst effect. Lots of leading lines here underneath the underpass, even those vertical pillars or drawing your eye into the center of the image here. Something I talk a lot about in the everything you always wanted to know about taking better photographs, but the second book, the compositional um, tips and techniques to guide your audience's view where you want them to look um, and to retain gaze into the center of the image rather than exit through. Um, this is a slightly different image, obviously, um, with the aperture spike here. This is the London Eye in uh, on the River Thames in London a very over photographed scene or a popular place for, for good reason. Um, in this particular image though, um, 
there was no reason to shoot at f16 or f18. Um, I knew I was going to be blurring the, the, the water. I wanted those light reflections to illuminate the water itself. So I didn't really need to choose to dial into F16, but there was a full moon. It was, uh, I think, what we call here an, a harvest moon one August a few years ago. And I knew that the, the moon is very, very bright. We'll talk about astrophotography right at the end briefly, but the moon is about 400,000 times dimmer than the sun, but it's still incredibly bright. So the white blob, I, I knew that the moon was always going to be overexposed and be this pure white um, you know, disc in the sky. I could have chosen to cut it out, but I quite liked the composition. So um, I thought about it, I thought, well, if I deliberately choose F16, I will, any bright light source will, be able to be used to to create the starburst effect and and so cho chose f16 kept the composition i've actually put things roughly on the rule of thirds for those who don't know that's a very simple compositional technique where you divide your image up into um, nine equal segments two vertical and two horizontal lines and then you can roughly position things either on those lines or where those lines interconnect and that gives you a nice sort of aesthetically pleasing composition so we can see that the water stops roughly on the horizontal rule of third the center of the london eye or the, the big wheel is on a, a vertical rule of third and the moon is roughly on the other one um, but as i say it's really about thinking about these techniques knowing how to do it and how to be able to um, achieve these from a depth of field point of view there is distance between the building perhaps so for example behind the london eye itself and the wheel it's, uh, but from a camera's point of view everything is pretty much on the same plane of focus because it's it's further away so it really doesn't need to i didn't need to be shooting with an hour aperture it's just a consideration you know, having all these different techniques that you're able to dip in and out of, I call it a, a photographic toolkit, you know, thinking about I can create an aperture spike here or some blurs there or do different things to help build up, as I mentioned in the earlier, layer upon layer of your, your images to create something um, unique and different. And something that I talk about in my 52 Assignments Travel book, you know, create what I call the alternative postcard. It's a good practice as photographers to really go to it doesn't have to be a landmark either or a popular place. It can be a popular place to you, one of those go-to places that you love going to to take images um, regularly and challenge yourself to try to take something different, something a little bit more unique. If it's a landmark, try to create a scene that maybe perhaps you haven't seen before, something interesting, and that can be choosing time of day, focal length, position, weather, all these different factors. Think about how you're going to do it. Um, and as I say, it's a, a great way to challenge yourself, to, to improve your, your, your photographic skills and your eye and your composition and those kind of things. I, I recommend everyone do that regularly. It's something I like to do myself but the aperture spikes here different lenses create different a number of blades or uh, due to the blades in the lens create different number of star points um the um uh you know the um uh, the effect is still nevertheless very very interesting and um it's a good tell now so when you see these star points you know that it's been shot with a deep depth of field um rather than you know obviously the shutter time but it's every time you see aperture spikes you know that um you know, the, the photographer has chosen to shoot about f16 or f18 um exposure time can really vary um the image previously i think david you were just asked um about the image in, under the Miami Causeway uh, bridge there. I think that that image was, was roughly about 45 seconds from, from what I recall. Um, but obviously um, with a narrow aperture, you're letting in very little light. Um, so, you know, you can obviously, if you want to increase the, the rate or the sensitivity, then you can increase your ISO if you didn't want to be standing around for 45 seconds or um, you didn't need to for whatever reason, the, the water was flattened out nicely for you or the reflections. Um, but I do like to, to leave my shutter open for as long as possible and use the native ISO, the base ISO, to get the, the best quality of images there. Um, moving on though, light trails, another fantastic way to add an extra element of interest to your images. Uh, as photographers, obviously most of us will probably know how they, they've achieved with long shutter speeds, um, slow shutter speeds, um, so that we give sufficient time for uh, vehicles or whatever it may be that's got a bright light to whiz through the scene. But don't forget, you'll often be showing your images to non-photographers who really get to see a bit of a wow factor, something really energetic and, and, and exciting. It really helps um, 
add a layer of extra interest, as I say, yet again to, to your images here at Tower Bridge in central London. Um, triggering your shutter, preferably before the, the, the moving vehicle, whatever it may be, in this case, cars and buses and bicycles and whatever, are, are entered into the scene. So they're coming in from the right hand side, most, mostly, obviously, you can see the white there for the headlights coming towards me, but generally the strength here is from, from the cars moving away and the buses, etc., from the right under and into the center of the image. So ensuring that the shutter is triggered just before that they enter into the scene so that there's a lot of fluidity of those lines. Um, but think about how you're going to incorporate your light trails. Here I'm using them again as a, a leading line. Um, it's guiding your eye into the center of the image here, the center point being the Tower of Tower Bridge. Lots of leading lines here. Obviously we've got the light trails, we've got this, the pavement or sidewalk on the left hand side. Even the wrought iron crisscross work um, of the bridge is all drawing your eye into the center point there. And you can see, um, you know, uh, using a very small aperture again you can see the aperture spikes in various places because i wanted all everything from all the tarmac on the roadway in the foreground off into the distance there um into being sharp focus deep depth of field and a very small aperture and you know you can see the resulting uh, uh towel there is is with those aperture spikes in various places but the, um, excuse me, light trails don't always have to be the main focal point either of your images here this is the wonderful Burr Hakim bridge in paris a beautiful Wall Iron Arc Deco bridge next to the Eiffel Tower. Now, again, lots of leading lines here. We can see all the vertical pillars. I'm standing on a cycle lane underneath the bridge, all drawing your eye into the center of the image. But equally so, you can see the car headlights on the left and the brake lights, tail lights, whatever you want to back lights, call them on the right hand side, the red ones. Now, I really should have included an image here where there were no car lights at all, no light trails, so that you could see, um, but hopefully you can imagine if you just had empty roadways here of just two strips of grey in the tarmac. Um, it would be lacking a little bit of balance here. I think the, the light trails balance out the image a little bit with those horizontal lines, but they also add a little bit of warmth. There's some nice colours that are helping to illuminate the scene. So they're really a byproduct in this image. It really just helps to settle things and balance them out rather than be the main focal points. And talking of focal points, I would say probably 95% of images that you see um, of light trails, um, you know, magazines or Instagram or whatever, are composites. This is actually a composite image of um, about taking over 25 minutes in various times. This is Battersea Power Station and the, the train lines here. Now I've gone overboard deliberately, obviously just to accentuate the points, but you know, taking quite a lot of images every time a train was coming from either direction, I would trigger the shutter and capture it for a good 20 or 30 second exposure, or sometimes a bit less depending on how fast the train was moving. But the camera is mounted on a tripod. Um, I use a, a remote release. My preference is a, is a wide remote release then to another set of batteries, I don't have to worry about running out or things change and that kind of thing, but whatever your preference may be. Um, but because the camera's not moving, you can capture uh, lots of different images at different times. Um, and then when you load them into Photoshop as a stack, and we'll talk about star trails in a moment, but the procedure is very, very similar. Um, choose your base image and then load that, uh, the rest of the images when you select those, the, the, every other image except the bottom image. If you just highlight those and choose the light and blend mode, um, every all that does is just reveal all the bright elements from all of those images, that whole stack of images on top of the, uh, the base image. So you're not really masking it. You don't have to mask anything out if you, if you know about uh, layer masks. It's literally the light and blend mode and that will make all the light trails pop and appear. And then you can choose which ones you want to include. As I say, in this case, I've deliberately done it for example purposes to go overboard, but you may have a car, uh, uh, excuse me, an, uh, an aeroplane light trail going horizontally across the image that's as, as a flashing light that may be um, a little bit frustrating and then you can mask that out, for example, but you can pick and choose, but it really is the light and blend mode. You can read more about that on my website, um, anthonyz.com. But going back onto light trails, it doesn't always have to be cars. I know that's the obvious choice, but you know, here in Amsterdam, we've got canal boats. Obviously, the shutter times depend on how fast your subject is moving. This canal boat was going very, very slowly. So it was actually quite a dark environment to the naked eye, but because the, I didn't want the uh, boat to, to be cut off in the middle here, it would have looked very strange if the light trail just stopped. I wanted a bit of um, movement and to go all the way through. So, um, 
that meant I had to use a, a bit more of a, a longer shutter time than I'd anticipated, which is why the image looks quite bright. But actually, you can see all the, the street lights, and there is a car light trail there over the bridge. But that's you know, it really was a lot darker than than it uh, what you know than it looks like in this particular image. But you know, in Venice, sometimes the the boats have different lights on them and and things like that, so you can get interesting illuminations that you wouldn't uh, otherwise be able to capture here in Paris. On the River Seine, there was a, a big neon colourful hoarding on the side of the uh, boat that sort of sailed past. And that really helped illuminate the, the underneath of this bridge and, and give it this sort of strange blue sort of LED tones, but not something I would have been able to do myself. So it was a bit fortuitous, I didn't plan that shot. But nevertheless, you know, it's worth bearing in mind that any light sources will, you know, result uh, on, on affecting your image, as we know, all the different colours of light. Um, light trails, if you can get up high here in Bratislava, there's a, uh, in um, Slovakia, there's a great uh, viewpoint over this main bridge, so uh, you can get up there, use the tripod, capture lots of light trails, and again, using them as a leading line towards this church, uh, which then you almost dive and it takes you over to Bratislava Castle. Pay careful attention at night, any buildings that are illuminated, and the white buildings, I should say, that are illuminated um, under spotlights because they will overexpose incredibly quickly. So better to take a couple of images if necessary to build up the light trails than one long image and have the resulting overexposed um, element in there. Um, here back into Paris, and um, again, we've got the uh, aperture spikes here, so that's the towel now that you now know that I shot this at F8, F16 or F18. Um, this is taken from the top of the Arc de Triomphe, which is a fabulous place to, to get a lovely views of, of beautiful Paris. Um, I chose F16 again because I wanted deep depth of field. You can see the buildings in the corners here, the foreground are in sharp focus all the way down the boulevard into the business district there, into the, um, the skyscrapers of La Defense, um, all in sharp focus. Um, the light trails, again, everything is guiding your eye towards the archway and the buildings there. Beautiful time of day, the, the blue hour again, as, as we talked about earlier, the light trails down the boulevard. Um, so lots of techniques here that I've just been mentioning, as I said, building them up layer upon layer, aperture spikes, light trails, blue hour, um, you know, depth the fields, taking careful consideration not to overexpose things. The the illuminated signs on the businesses there are not overexposed, and that's one of the first things you should watch for if you're photographing skyscrapers at night, because obviously these are these highlights uh, will always overexpose very, very quickly. So pay careful attention. Um, as I say, I do some commercial architectural work. Very important for me to ensure that I don't blur any client's logo. Um, but equally, I think as photographers themselves, even if it's not commercial work, just you know, for completeness, make sure you, that it would detract from an image if you just have white blobs of overexposed information. It's better to pay careful attention to all these little details um, and really helps raise the bar of the quality of your images um, above your um, contemporaries. But the light trails, as I say, really can just add something interesting into um, an image. Take care if it's you know, a lot of traffic. We have a lot of traffic in London um, at certain part, parts of the day. So unfortunately, if you have a lot of stopping and starting of cars, um, then you will have broken light trails and they won't be particularly um, uh, visually appealing. So you want that fluidity to trigger the shutter just before um, the, the cars enter into the scene. But again, here's a slightly similar shot, just in the basis of choosing. I took some with the light trail, some without, some with the aperture spikes, some without, and then decided which layer upon layer what I wanted to include. And in this example, I decided to include everything just to for, for completeness for the, for the presentation. But it's nice to have that um, that option. Going back though, you can use light trails in different ways as well. Here, um, Big Ben, the Elizabeth Clock Tower in central London. Going back to what I was saying, the alternative postcard, you know, capture that image that is so faux for photographing at Big Ben, um, it's photographed thousands of times a day, um, but trying to create something unique, very, very visually different, something you haven't seen before. And you here, I chose to try to think outside the box, you know, use this double decker bus as a light trail to guide your eye towards um, the, the clock tower. Now, we read this photograph like we read a book, so your eyes will enter in from the left hand side and, and follow these light trails down from the left towards the right. Now, I Different to the image that I showed you earlier with the canal boats and the light trails, where I said I didn't want to break um, the fluidity of it there and the continuation. Here I did deliberately because I wanted the 
light trails to take you to the subject, which the subject here is the clock tower, and stop. And I want you, your eyes in to focus in on the main um, interesting part of the image. Now, if I had left the bus to um, exit down in the bottom right hand corner, then your eyes would enter in from the left, follow these bright light trails, because our eyes are always kind of drawn to the brighter elements and lines and things like that. Our brain looks for repetition and patterns and these kind of things. Um, but it would have exited in the bottom right hand corner as quickly almost as it would have entered and subconsciously you would be ready to flip on to look onto the next image. Um, so by stopping it there, breaking that, um, uh, that sort of repetition of line, um, which is you know, compositionally something that's very, very important, you can have repetition, but if you break that, it really sort of jolts the brain, something I talk about a lot, composition and everything you always wanted to know about taking better photographs. Um, but here, you know, really drawing your eye into, leading it into where I want you to, to look. Now, if you want to replicate an image like this, actually the way to do it is not quite how it visually looks. The bus is actually coming from the right-hand side, not the left. So it was coming towards me. Um, and um, so I triggered the shutter button when the bus had just got, the front of the bus had just got just before the clock tower and then left the shutter open for the duration until the bus exited. It would have been much more difficult if the bus was coming in from the left hand side to close the shutter at the right time and have a nice fluidity there, much easier to do it the other way round. Um, so that's that's the how to do it really uh, technique or tip on this particular image. You know, make sure that you trigger it just before. I like to use bold mode um, and bold mode for those who don't know is where you dial in the ISO, you dial in the aperture and then you use a remote release um, to open the shutter, lock it open or hold down the button and then the button again or release the button to close the shutter. And what that does is it enables me to be much more precise with um, the shutter speed. And in certain cases, it's very, very useful because I wasn't sure exactly how fast the bus was going to go, so go through the scene. Um, so if I had dialed in whatever it was going to be, you know, eight seconds or 15 seconds, and the bus had driven out of the scene after seven seconds and there was another eight seconds left, then I'm overexposing the scene unnecessarily and I'm, I've got no control. But what I could do is control the shutter uh, as soon as the bus had exited on the left hand side there, close the shutter because I know that I've had sufficient time. Yes, I'd taken test images before, so I knew that the exposure was going to be correct for the, um, the clock tower. That's very, very important. The clock face is not a, I mean, is everything incredibly sharp? I, I, I use manual focus, live view, zoomed in at 100% to make sure everything is incredibly sharp focus because that's very important um, to me but also um, exposure I didn't want that clock face to be overexposed um, I wanted you to be able to read the time read the minutes on the, on the, on the clock face so that was incredibly important um, another final image I just wanted to say about light trials is have some fun as well you know this is an image I, I created to take um, uh, created really to form my my book mastering on exposure having a little bit of fun with blur creative use of blur but also light trails um, it's, it's a left-hand drive car I'm driving it it's when I used to live in the US not that that's particularly relevant here but um, what the technique is is, is quite useful. Um, here, the camera is mounted on a tripod. Um, most tripods have little catches on the on the legs, which enable you to get the camera to a lower viewpoint, lower to the ground. You can open up the legs a little bit wider than normal, and that can help you. So I could have fixed the, the the camera really rigidly on the back of the car against the door and using the footwell, so the camera's wasn't going to move, it was really super secure. Now I pre-focused the camera into the dashboard, I put the camera into drive mode, so what that is is that the camera will take image after image, one after the other in succession, fast succession. Um, using a wide remote, um, dialed in an aperture of about f11, something like that, um, 30 seconds exposure time, and then I've just locked open the shutter, uh, pre-focused on the dashboard, and then I've just locked open the shutter, and then I just drove around for a little bit, not touching the camera or the remote at all, until I parked up safely, and then I can close the shutter, and then when I got back to the computer, I got lots of lovely light trails, lots of images. So you could do this yourself, you could put your camera, you know, you could run down the road holding it, you could put it in the basket of a bicycle. There are so many different ways you can do light trails, have some fun, you could have friends run down the road or drive away with, you know, down country paths or the road or whatever it may be. Um, really think outside the box, it's really down to your imagination how you can use you know, long exposures and create light trails and, and create compelling images. Um, moving on and um, 
thank you for everyone like sticking around because it's uh, you know covering a lot of information here but um, you know, hopefully a lot that you'll find um, useful tips and, and techniques but neon lights they can be very very difficult at night to photograph face on it can be very difficult to either have a correctly exposed neon sign or a correctly exposed environment the dynamic range is very broad neon lights are very very um, bright so i do recommend if you're photographing neon like here in um, south beach in miami um do it side on like this so that you get a lovely sort of glow a lovely illumination if you if it's important to you to illuminate the the architecture for example too here you get a nice graduation of light from the brightness of the sign all the way down the side of the building into um into the left hand side where it's just clipping the bits of the, of the frame but it really helps create a sense of mood and feeling and it's much more cinematic it's much more appealing it's you know uh, there's a bit more mystery here and again something to talk about in everything you always wanted to know the, the human psyche loves mystery and intrigue as i mentioned earlier we, we like to see questions in the images that we ask ourselves yeah what's going on what, what how did the photographer do this why did they do this what's going on in the scene and that slows you down that slows down um wanting to move on to see another image because we're inundated by images and i i think that that's really sort of compelling it creates a compelling image when your audience connects with it by, by wanting to know more about the scene now i've talked about exposure or mentioned exposure but it's very very important when we're at night here um westminster bridge this is a very sort of popular place to take a photograph of a beautiful scene in london now um deep depth of field to the foreground elements here the wall all the way down through the bridge off into the distance to the clock tower etc now aperture spikes here are the result in fact of using a deep depth of field and a narrow aperture um so the lights on westminster bridge for those who don't know are in sets of three which is why there were so many broad um uh, aperture spikes but what i wanted to say in this is talk about very quickly about histograms now a histogram is a bar chart an x and y axis that shows you a lot of information about um, what you see in your scene from tonality point of view so the far left hand side is the, the, the along the x-axis or the horizontal axis is the pure black and then all the way through gets um, from all the midtones, brighter and brighter and brighter, all the way up into the far right and the pure white. Now, pure white and pure black don't have any information. It's just purely underexposed or purely overexposed. There's no data there that you can recover. So if you were looking at a histogram of this particular image, you can see that the center of those bulbs in, on the bridge of those lights are overexposed. So you would have a peak on the right hand side of the histogram. Now, I don't use a histogram. I shoot raw files, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but uh, a histogram that you see in your camera is only, even if you're shooting raw only, is a, a histogram for a JPEG, what the JPEG would have been if you were capturing that in your camera. So there's a caveat there. But why I don't use a histogram is because it's not that helpful. I know that I was going to be overexposing the street lights. The dynamic range was never going to enable me to capture the filaments on those lights and capture the scene as well. What was more important to me, and much more important, was that the clock face of the uh, Elizabeth Clock Tower is uh, not only sharp, but but actually correctly exposed and wasn't just a white blob. And if you could zoom in, I can zoom in for you, you would be able to see it's, it, it's correctly exposed. You can see all the hands, you can see all the dial and all the details on the dial, etc. But what I use is the highlight priority warning. And what that is, is you look at the back of the camera when you're reviewing the image, anything that's purely underexposed or overexposed will flash. And that way, when I'm out in the field, I can review the image, I can see that the only bits that were flashing are the street lights, and I'm not worried that I've overexposed those. That, I knew that was going to happen, but the clock face wasn't flashing, and I knew that there was information there. I hadn't overexposed. If I was just relying on the histogram, I would then have to review the image, zoom around, try to make sure, which, find out which elements were overexposed, and then waste time. Lights changing very quickly at night, uh, long exposure times, perhaps, you know, you just want to be able to pack up and move on. So a caveat if you use histograms, it's very important back on Big Ben again, but just to emphasize the clock faces, if these were just two white blobs, um, would just be uh, a throwaway image. It's important to have your highlights correctly exposed for imperative, in fact. Um, quite often you've got a very wide dynamic range at night, uh, well, most of the time. You've got a lot of shadow information and a lot of highlights. Our eyes are fantastic and the ability to, to um, see all of that at the same time that a camera struggle so it's worth bearing in mind that uh, you know pay careful attention to to those highlights um 
here at this building, beautiful uh, reflections of downtown Miami, but we can see that one overexposed element there. I, I pushed as long as I could shutter wide to ex exposure um, to ensure that I got lovely reflections from on the water from the buildings. But those sign, that sign on that one particular building, about three feet of the way across, as you can see at the top, is overexposed. I went back another day, obviously it's very different, it was a bit more choppy and, and whatever, but I correctly exposed everything, but you can see it's a very, very different feel um, to the image before, not as bright, um, Got a different, just generally got a very, very different feel, not as pronounced reflections. You, there's always quite often a trade off between um, correctly exposing an image and getting lovely long reflections. And there's also the factor of wind and the speed of the water moving and things like that to factor in. So there, there are a lot of factors to, to think about, but as I say, make sure that your first element is to, to correctly expose your image here back in Bratis Marlboro again. This is underneath the bridge from that other image with the white trails. But um, you know, correctly expose the scene and then work from there because it's much better to then be able to sort of factor in um, uh, how much you know light information you're going to get from reflections and other things like that, light trails perhaps, um, as long as your scene is, is correctly exposed for. Work, working backwards is, is, is the way, it may seem a little bit illogical to do it that way, but actually it works the best way. And as I say, sometimes there is just going to be a trade off movement on the water, wind, you know, the Thames here, the River Thames is, is a very fast flowing river, so it's very hard to get very strong, prominent um, reflections um, in the blue hour. You really have to move, use very, very long shutter times, and that, uh, you know, which would then mean that you need a very, very dark sky to, to do that properly. Otherwise, everything is just going to become overexposed. Now, nighttime, um, obviously lots of colour, vibrant colour, but don't, don't rule out um, shooting um, black and white images. You know, you still get wonderful images there with high contrast, still compelling. So just because you, you're, you're taking the colour out of an image here at the Tower of London, don't rule out taking images with, with black and white. You get these wonderful contrast shadows, you know, sense of mood and feeling and um, this image here underneath the Eiffel Tower was um, taken it looks a bit like a uh, infrared but it was it's just the way that I processed it in a very very high contrast way with a very dark black for the sky and, and obviously the illuminations which are very yellow at night um, into the sort of strong white tonality but again really helps draw your eye into the intricacies of the wrought ironwork here underneath excuse me, the Eiffel Tower itself. But again, you can have these wonderful stark images in black and white at night. So, so don't rule that, you know, rule that out. It doesn't always have to be colour. But the colour, do pay careful attention to, to white balance. As I mentioned before, our cameras have amazing equipment now, amazing ability to, to work out all this information for you. So utilise it. Here, the horizontal band at the top of the image above the yellow line is uh, the correct correctly altered white balance. I fixed it in post-production from a raw file. And the bottom left is the shade um, or white balance preset and the bottom right the tungsten and you can see the difference in the tonalities there. So this is where it's very, very important to, to have you know, a, a correctly calibrated monitor Tying in obviously with, with BenQ, I use it. I'm proud to be a BenQ ambassador. Um, I've utilized BenQ monitors for a long time, long before I was invited to become an ambassador. Fantastic to the color calibrated outside uh, straight out the factory. You get the calibration report when, they, when you buy them for your individual monitor. Um, but I know that it's you know accurate, 100 percent accurate, and that's vital to me as a photographer. My images are used not just online but in print and in, in, in campaigns and books and all that kind of thing. And it's it's imperative to know that I'm working from um, a position where it's it's important to be able to, to get back to exactly a true to life rendition of what you're seeing and that's vital and then from there any edits that you make are going to then be um, correct and accurate whether you're going into print or, or your own printing onto photograph paper or into books or whatever it may be any edits that you're making any tonal, tonal changes and things like that are all based around something that is absolutely color accurate. Now, I'll show you what I mean. And um, this is a, a, an image I took in Havana in Cuba, old town of Havana in Cuba. Beautiful old classic cars as we know that abound in that city. Now, I shoot raw um, files only. Um, there's nothing wrong with shooting JPEGs, but I do recommend raw files. It gives so much more information. Um, I want to edit the images how I, see them what, what i saw when i was there your camera has presets from from factory presets on jpeg so obviously 
that's going to add in contrast and um, you know, saturation and vibrancy and all those kind of things. We, I want to be able to control that. Um, the computer that I use, my MacBook Pro, is so much more powerful than the, the uh, computer on my phone, uh, excuse me, on my camera, very, very small. So I want that uh, ability to do it. Now, there's nothing wrong with capturing JPEGs, as I said, you want a fast um, image straight away to, to email out, but capture a raw file as well. In this particular image, we can see that there's a strong blue light coming in from the right hand side, from this doorway. There was an old fluorescent um, uh, tube lamp that's illuminating the, the street here at the side of the car. Now, the, the buildings themselves, strong yellow hues, and then off in the distance are a couple of LED lights, one that's a touch overexposed actually, but nevertheless, it's a little bit sort of bluey white. Now, this is the color fixed version that I, I have. Um, process correctly. Raw files capture all of the different white balance information and I have full flexibility to color correct it without degrading the image quality. This is what my camera took. Um, you can see that it's neutralized the blue hues on the right hand side from the doorway and, and made them white. But then the yellow lamps have gone orange. The blue car looks a little bit orange too. The sky's got magenta rather than blue. It doesn't know whether to color correct the blue into nothing or the yellows in, you know, it's trying to fix things and it doesn't know what's correct. Why would it? It hasn't got that kind of brain. So it's very, very important to, to do capture images in raw so you can go back and correct things as they were. This is what it looked like. This is what the scene looked like to me. And that gave me the full flexibility to take it from that to, to what it should really look like. Again, a color corrected image here of, um, the Millennium Bridge in, in central London and St Paul's. Now, this is quite interesting, I, I think. The top left image is the same one I just showed you, the color corrected version. Now, I've given five other examples. Now, if you were shooting JPEG only, and would you have chosen to shoot this in fluorescent, which is in the bottom right corner, which is actually the closest, I would say, to the color corrected version? Um, I wouldn't have thought that. I would have thought, well, perhaps, you know, um, the cloudy version because it was a cloudy evening but that's still on the bottom left but that's still quite yellowy so if i shot this in jpeg i would have been ultimately stuck with the white balance that i'd chosen it's very very difficult you destroy the image trying to color correct it really um so do shoot raw to pay careful attention to to your color your white balance um you know if you're in an urban environment here this in Manhattan, in you know, Midtown Manhattan in, in New York City. If you like cinematic images, you know, wonderful type places to go. I used to live in, in, in New York as well. Um, every street corner looks like you're in a movie scene, and so it's a wonderful place to capture this, you know, feeling of, uh, of that sort of movie environment. And if you want to fix and, and color fix your images, it's important to be able to fix them first and before you then move into different tonalities here, having a bit of a play with all these different feels. From, you know, look up tables and Photoshop, for example, trying to get a bit more of a cinematic feel. Um, it, it really sort of helps there to have a color accurate monitor to be able to get the images back to what they should look like first and then be able to edit them into different ways um, to, to change them to, to get them to, to, you know, how you may want them to look, make them a bit more futuristic with blue tones or soft blue tones, you know, have some fun with it um, in that regard. But I do think, you know, it's important to know that you are able to fix your images correctly due to your accurate screens and therefore if you're going to print your images they're going to look like what you've got on your screen is going to be what you look like in your book or in your email um, or you know on your printed in your printed version too and then finally i'm going to just quickly touch on astrophotography um i'd be amiss to not talk about the beautiful starry night sky here uh, the milky way rising over uh, what we call uh, Lulworth Cove or Durdle Door here in the south coast of, it, of the England or the UK. Um, this is actually a composite image. Now it's a 25 second exposure for the Milky Way itself and about a minute and a half or something like that for the foreground. Now I do use Photoshop, I do use it as a tool for editing when I need to. Um, I, as a photographer, I think it's better to have the integrity of taking those images straight away i don't put things in that weren't in my images box of birds and trees but each to their own but in this particular case i had no alternative than to use two different shutter speeds you need to take photographs of the milky way or when you take photographs of the milky way you need to do it when there's no moon or uh no moonlight or a new moon because the moon as i've said is incredibly bright and that will wash out the sky and the faint stars in the sky in the milky way 
faint, they're far away. So if there was a full moon, you're not going to get a good view, a clear view of the Milky Way. It's going to be very washed out. Equally so, moonlight will fantastically illuminate your foreground and your, your environment, which I'll show you an image in a moment, um, because it's incredibly bright. So it's a trade-off you do need to use um, the long shot of time then to gather in enough ambient light to illuminate seen. Um, I didn't have a torch powerful enough to, to paint in the light myself. Now if you go beyond 25 seconds then you start moving into um, the circular um, star trails. This is the cover of my book, Master of Exposure. It was taken in the Florida Everglades and it's got a real sort of wow factor to it in the sense of you're condensing a long period of time with this, this long exposure and showing your audience something they don't ordinarily get to see and that's quite you know, the joy, I think, of photographing at night and photographing using long exposures. You have that ability to, to reveal the intricacies of, of the movement of time and things that move that we know. We know the stars of the Earth rotates around you know, the, the sun and, and rotates itself. We know that the tides come in out. We know clouds move sometimes we can see, but not that easily. And it's similarly, when you take, if you take them for those who take macro photos, if you're zooming into those minute details, you know, one to one, true to life size, or beyond, you know, two to one, three to one, that kind of thing. You're revealing those details to your audience that don't, they don't get to see what a, I don't know, sugar cube looks up that, that close, almost like under a microscope. And long periods of time. So we can see the rotation of the Earth here. In the center of the concentric circles is the North Star, so you find the North Star. Um, and this is about 150 or so, something like 180 images, all taken at 30 seconds after capturing the rotation of the, of the Earth. Um, the camera's not moving, it's mounted on a tripod, something I really should have emphasized throughout this presentation. You need a sturdy tripod, um, not something so heavy that you begrudge carrying it with you, something lightweight that you can pack up, carry, set up quickly, carbon fiber I recommend is the way to go, but um, nevertheless, just something that um, you, could, you don't begrudge having with you, that you will take with you and use. Um, and another tip here is, is really not to use the, the center column unless you really have to, because it's great to have the three legs of a tripod for stability, but if you then keep using, extending the center column as far up um, as it can go, then your camera will still shake on that part of it. So you're, you're undermining the, the strength of it. So really, or stability of it, I should say. So, you know, unless you really have to, just don't extend the center column. But going back onto this image here, so lots of, compositional things here too, leading line of the bridge, guiding your eye towards, you know, an illuminated, back illuminated, it's a fishing, uh, a hunter's lodge or a lightning sort of, uh, lodge in the Everglades. But it was a fun part for me as a photographer. I'll never forget parking the car, walking over that rickety bridge um, in the middle of nowhere. There were alligators in there. I could see them and hear them thinking, you know, this old bridge, if, if, if it's rotten, I'm gonna fall in there. There were fireflies there over on the right hand side, those little green, light I'd never seen before. Absolutely sort of enthralling time to step back and capture lots of images um, of the night sky, you know, beautiful clear skies and that magic hopefully sort of translates itself into, into the image. Now as long as your eye can see some, some stars then your camera is going to do a fantastic job of capturing the star information. You know you want to increase the sensitivity of your ISO or of your camera sensor so boosting the ISO to a point where you know your particular camera can handle that amount of noise and that amount of um, you know, it's a trade-off obviously not to go too high where you, your image is too noisy but then not too low where you're not going to pick up the faint stars but here the radio satellite dishes at uh, telescopes at um, Cambridge University in the UK a um, little bit of light pollution there we can see it looks more like sunset but actually that's just the the, the street lights from the local town and and, and um, roadways and things like that but I could see stars it was a clear night um, I did my research you know I checked to make sure that it was, that it was going to be clear night skies um, and um, even though there is that light pollution it doesn't really detract too much so you're just taking images or image after image um, there are pros and cons to uh, using one long image uh, or lots of little images I recommend 30 seconds each time um, and combine them together as I said with those light trails using the light and blend mode in Photoshop and that just makes all the light trails appear the same you know uh, the star trails appear the same way as the light trails if you do one long image you run the risk of you know kicking the tripod in the dark then you ruin the whole thing um, You'll have a lot of aeroplane lights that will fly through the scene. You won't, it won't be so easy to remove those, for example, because of the layer to layer. 
and, and condensation it, it can be quite a big thing cold nights the battery the, uh, if you've got the camera shutter open for a long time the heat from the camera battery will uh, create condensation on your lens so you do need to pay careful attention to that if you're taking one long image so i do recommend lots of individual images i have the camera on drive mode i lock open the remote shutter widest open aperture so that i'm letting in as much light a nice sensitivity on the ISO, let's say, um, and I talk about that much more detail in Mastering on Exposure, my book. You do have the option of obviously painting in light. Here, this uh, beautiful uh, ruined castle or folly actually was built like this, um, using bright flashlights, wearing dark clothes. I walked into the scene while the camera's on the tripod taking all these images. The light trails are much more condensed because I took um, a lot more images over a longer period of time. I think it's about over 300 in this particular image. But I painted in light where I thought it should appear. And then in post-production, I was able to load in all the different individual images and work out where I painted light that I liked. It wasn't too bright, it wasn't too dark. And because I'm wearing dark clothing and moving through the scene, I'm not um, captured at all as I'm walking in front of the camera lens. But you know, this image of this beautiful castle, it's Bo uh, Bodium Castle here in England and in the Southeast. And, I want you to sort of almost just imagine that there were no light trails here, um, star trails. You know, it's, it's, it was a beautiful evening. It was very still day. It's still night. Um, yes, that's light pollution again, rather than a sunset. But lovely reflections. I've framed it in a nice compositionally what compositional way. But including light trails adds another layer of interest to what would be an interesting image. It's very, as I say, very picturesque looking castle. Anyway, you can see the aperture spike. So I did take a couple of images with a narrow aperture um, just to get that lovely starburst effect, but then took most of my images for the night sky with wide open. Um, so a very, uh, very large aperture to let in as much light as I could and then deciding to include the star trails obviously that's part of the mission of, of going out to take this particular composition but thinking about what you're going to do it's adding another layer of interest to an image um, it's not all about the star trails but it's something else an additional sort of bonus when looking at a very picturesque castle um, here a composite of the, the full moon going into uh, the eclipse of the moon um, here I use the um, we talked about um, uh, evaluative metering modes. Here I used the spot metering because it was more important to make sure that uh, the spot meter on the moon itself rather than the environment because I knew that the sky was going to be darkened down anyway. So um, obviously it's a composite, um, but um, just bear that in mind that the moon is incredibly bright, so you're going to use a fast shutter speed to get even this kind of contrast. Um, so here I've used, I'm just looking at ISO 400, around 1 250th of a second in this particular image. I think this was taken at 300 millimeters or something like that. Um, maybe 400 if I recall, can't really recall, I apologize. But yeah, more important here is the shutter speed, 1 over 250th of a second to, to get um, some information there on the, on the surface of the moon, not just overexposure. And then finally, or almost finally actually, is, uh, as I said, moonlight can illuminate a scene and up in the mountains is useful when you get this blue tonality, the, the moonlight is a little bit blue, and so it's a lovely time when you've got a full moon there to, to illuminate your scene. Long exposures get a bit of movement there with the clouds and the mist and the fog and that kind of thing, but you know, don't rule out going out at night thinking, well, yes, you've got a torch, that's great, but taking photographs in the, in the uh, you know away from the urban environment at night with a full moon is, is a beautiful time to, to head out and, and photograph and then just finally neutral density filters here back onto the you know the picture of, of Miami here um, using um, just a polarizing filter here actually so flattens out the water a little bit it's a long exposure just to gather in enough light polarizing to get this lovely sort of uh, extra sort of pop on the sky at sunset. Um, but then when you use a six dot neutral density filter, you can get some flattens out the water, you get the streaks in the sky a lot more, um, a very, very different feel to the image from here to here using neutral density filters. Be careful, the shutter times can be, become very, very long. A 30 second exposure with a, a six dot neutral density filter um, can you know, be well over 10 minutes. So um, there's a caveat there that it is a bit of an investment of time if you're going to use, um, certainly when the skies get a lot darker, but you can get a lovely um, way to capture the movement of the, the, the clouds in the sky, um, flattens out the water as I say, and then finally um, removing people, great way to people, that, uh, photographers, many photographers don't realise that you can 
remove crowds by using neutral density filters. Neutral density filters is a dark piece of glass, restricts the amount of light that, that can pass through, enables you to use very, very long shutter times that have a 16 stop. A neutral density filter from Hoyer that enables me to shoot, you know, seven, eight minute exposures um, quite easily during the day. So, fantastic piece of kit, something I talk about in great detail um, in mastering long exposure. Um, I've got lots of free guides on my website, um, antimeset.com, so please do, you know, feel free to, to check that out. And just a, you know, a quick reminder, here's all my contact information, you know, you can please do, you know, email me, check me out on Instagram, great, if you, know, you like my work, please do follow. Um, but also, um, don't forget, the great guys at um, Park Cameras are um, giving you a code, a discount code exclusively for coming along tonight or sitting along, I should say, um, and, and enduring my presentation on um, photographing the night. But check out the chat box because um, a great team have, have put the exclusive code for you guys there. Um, but that's my presentation on photographing the night sky. I do hope you've enjoyed it. As I say, please do check out my work, whether it's via my books, website, you know, um, I do teach lots of private classes and masterclasses and things, and I'd be delighted to hopefully meet some of you in person as well sometime. Um, but thank you very, very much. It's uh, been a pleasure. I do hope you find this, found this inspirational and a good refresher of um, some old techniques that maybe you've not used for a while and um, a little bit inspiring to head out and try some new ones too. Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs>